pikespeaksdbc.org. Greetings. Um, thanks to Pikes Peak Small Business Development Center for hosting the summit and for the invitation to speak. Today's discussions are really important. What a great opportunity to learn from one another during this Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I've titled my presentation, It's a Small World After All, How Global Cyber Trends Affect Us All, because it is important to remember that cyber threats and defense is a global problem and one that we'll need global collaboration to solve. We all play a role. As far as technology goes, while the US in many ways is advanced, other countries and people are finding ways to disrupt, extort, and generally benefit from our vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, we are all vulnerable. How we manage that vulnerability will determine our success. A little bit of an introduction about myself. Um, I'm an international lawyer with telecommunication and information technology legal experience with a very strong emphasis on global policy within tech. I've spent a lot of time helping countries think through their cyber laws um, and data privacy policies. Some of those countries include Uganda and Zambia. Like many in the crowd, I am a small business owner. I run a, law, a small law firm and I operate my business across borders. So some of the threats that I am going to discuss today are very real and relevant to me on a daily basis. Besides working on policy, um, an aspect that I've also worked on in the past um, is serving on the board of Bank of Zambia, which is Zambia's central bank. In that role, I served as the chair of the Information Communication and Technology Subcommittee of the board. And I worked very closely with the financial sector to think through some of the issues that we will be talking about today around not only cybersecurity, but other vulnerabilities within the financial services sector. The last part of my experience that's relevant to today's conversation is that I serve as the compliance lead for the China Law and Development Project at Oxford University. As we talk through some of the issues, what will come up strong is the role of China in cybersecurity um, now, and really some ideas of how we as small business owners um, can sensitize ourselves to what's going on in the world, but also how we can work with one another to counter um, some of the influences of China and other countries. Coming back to the presentation, uh, today's focus will be on global trends and its impact on small businesses. Cybersecurity um, was definitely a problem um, before COVID-19, but it's now been heightened with the number of people working from home and working remotely. Some of the common threats to small businesses are malware, um, which is kind of the umbrella term that refers to um, software that's intentionally designed to cause damage to a computer um, or a computer network. Um, I won't get into ransomware, uh, but it's also a type of malware. Another threat is viruses, which are harmful programs that uh, spread from one computer to another um, and give um, hackers access to your system. The last one um, I'll talk about is phishing, um, which is a type of cyber attack um, that uses email um, or a malicious website to infect your machine and collect sensitive information. So when I talk about cyber threats today, I'm using the broad umbrella of those three rather than talking about um, individual threats. I think it's important as I start this conversation to dig into some data that really highlights um, the gravity of what we are experiencing today. Um, according to the FBI's internet report, the cost of cyber crimes reached $2.7 billion in 2020. 
obviously small businesses were part of that um, amount. And we're especially vulnerable um, because one, we're not, we don't think we're the obvious target. They're in and of it, uh, itself making us a very obvious target. And also we lack some of the security infrastructures that large businesses have. According to the Small Business um, Association survey, 88% of small business owners felt their businesses were vulnerable to cyber attacks but unfortunately didn't have the capacity or the know-how of how to deal with that. Lack of resources is definitely um, something that I've experienced over time at different times of running my business, but it's definitely one that with resources um, like you know this business center, you will be able to get additional information on how to protect yourself. 95% of cyber attacks of uh, cyber attacks and breaches were due to human error. Um, that gives me confidence that if we start to change our mentality and if we start to teach one another better practices, that number might reduce. Unfortunately, for small businesses that have had cyber breaches, it takes up about 50 or so um, cost days. Uh, to get back and running um, from such attacks. Obviously, that's a lot of time and a lot of money and resources wasted. Um, the economic impact for individual businesses can be anywhere upwards of $50,000. Small businesses tend to also go out of businesses within six months of attack, and the stat on that is about 60%. So if you do um, get attacked, unfortunately, there's a huge likelihood that you may not be in business sometime thereafter. The last point I'd like to highlight is the fact that 90% of small businesses don't use any form of data protection for their companies. That's a scary statistic because of the amount of confidential information we have on customers and clients. Um, and in my case, um, being a lawyer, just a lot of valuable information uh, were someone um, trying to get that. I'll go ahead and move to um, what I've kind of put within the slides as the global state of affairs. Um, I'll start with China, but I say China really to cover a myriad of other state actors that have been very active in um, the cyber hacking space. That includes Russia and North Korea. Now, the story of foreign cyber attacks really is multifaceted. Um, state warfare um, is definitely a part of kind of the global race to um, technology superiority, but it's also definitely a way of attacking other states, whether it's through having paid operatives um, or other criminal contractors or state entities or academic institutions, the number of people um, that are able to be used in such attacks is numerous. And in the case of the countries I mentioned, China, Russia, and North Korea, they've used all of these um, to attack not only the United States, but other um, countries around the world as well. What I found in my research also is that geopolitical factors really determine how much governments engage in cyber um, warfare and when they engage in cyber warfare. To give an example, uh, during the Obama administration, um, Obama negotiated with China um, to deal with um, hacking incidences and worked on cooperation to reduce those. Unfortunately, once President Trump came in, um, due to the adversarial nature of the relationship between Trump and Xi Jinping, um, that communication, that agreement broke down and there was a notable increase in the number of attacks from Chinese operatives um, on, in the US um, towards US businesses. Um, another aspect that I think is important to understand is really the role of the China Digital Silk Road, um, which is part of the broader Belt and Road Initiative. China set out um, to build infrastructure around the world. Part of the hard infrastructure is roads, 
dams and the like, but there also is a concerted effort by the Chinese government to focus on building digital capacity across especially developing countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The result of this is not only Chinese involvement in the construction of telecommunications infrastructure, but it's also the prolifer proliferation of Chinese um, technology within emerging markets. Huawei, for instance, is the most has the highest market share of devices on the African continent. Um, they're also in the process of winning and bidding um, on uh, the construction and maintenance of data centers. What that does is it creates a sole reliance on um, Chinese infrastructure, and in all essence also makes African countries more vulnerable. Africa is not alone in this vulnerability. And even though um, China and the US have had an ongoing um, turf war over Africa and the tech space, what is evident is that the digital self Silk Road is all over the world, and China has managed to um, influence how countries spend on technology, and in essence, also how vulnerable they might be um, to um, cyber incidents as well. Now, some of the issues related to you know foreign countries is that it's really difficult to track and prosecute them when when any incidents happen. Whilst uh, law enforcement in one country might be able to find um, a perpetrator across the world, it really becomes hard to extradite them and try them in the U.S. So until there is a global system that makes it more seamless to prosecute, it still is very, very hard to catch some of these offenders. Another challenge is that there is, even though this is a global problem, um, unfortunately, we haven't taken a global problem solving um, approach um, and collaboration. The result is that each country tries to defend itself. There are small um, groups that work together, but there is no real global response. The Biden government is trying really hard to get a coalition of the willing to buy in and to really support um, cyber security around the world. But it begs the question that if it's only a small group of countries, what happens to other countries and what happens to even more vulnerable countries um, that don't have the resources necessarily to defend themselves? The other challenge is really around the lack of a sectoral approach. If different sectors, for instance, the financial services sector focused on a united approach, there might be progress. But unfortunately, that is not the case. So I think as we um, end this year on a high, you know, engaging around climate change, I think the question I pose for next year is, can we focus more on a unified sectoral, but also global approach to um, cyber security. The second aspect um, of you know, global trends that I think is important is just to understand the increased connectivity and vulnerability um, that has resulted as a, as a result of that connectivity. As of January this year, 4.6 billion people out of 7.8 billion people are on, are connected to the internet. That is huge. That is about 59% uh, percent of the world. And 92% of the people that are accessing the internet are accessing the internet by mobile phone. That definitely shows us that numbers will continue to increase and numbers in very populous countries, especially within the global south, will continue to access the internet through the mobile phone. That increases to a certain degree some of the vulnerabilities that people will have. Some of the trends that um, I've been you know, particularly paying attention to are just around new technologies and new devices and how reliant we are on connecting these new devices to the internet. Um, another aspect is, you know, with COVID-19, um, a lot more people around the world have been forced to um, engage more on the internet. 
particularly from a commerce perspective. So increased uh, use of trade through the internet and the purchase of goods and services is another one that increases vulnerability as people input their financial information online, but don't necessarily have the protection um, of that information. The rise of cryptocurrencies um, has also been a huge factor in increasing vulnerability, in part because of the difficulty in tracing. Um, it's definitely allowed cyber criminals to be able to um, request money without being traced easily. And so that's definitely an area that uh, central banks, for instance, the one I sat on, are constantly monitoring and paying attention to. Another one um, that I think has come up more recently is really an attack on cloud services. With COVID-19, um, a lot more people are working remotely. A lot more small businesses are also starting to move their information to the cloud. But what hasn't been done as well is really um, emphasizing the need to protect um, how we interact with the cloud as well, whether that is the deletion of information or the uploading of information and just understanding the vulnerabilities that exist with the cloud. Um, another aspect that I think is important is really just around, um, you know, still around, you know, remote work and just understanding that work of the future will continue to be online and will continue to be um, remote. Um, I read a statistic that 36 million Americans will work remotely by 2025. That is huge. Um, and it definitely increases the risk. So the questions for us as business owners is how do we make sure that as we employ more people, we continue to um, sensitize them to the threats that lie not only to themselves, but also to our businesses. Lastly, I think on this one is really that, um, you know, in a report of 2020 um, from Kaspersky mentioned that um, 10% of computer owners experience some type of malware attack. Um, that is huge and that number is growing. So now that we you know, know that that's growing, the question is, you know, what, what next? You know, as watchers of you know, the IT industry, um, you know, what, do we keep, what do we continue to keep as top of mind to protect ourselves? Um, I will go ahead and move to the third point, which is really around critical infrastructure. Unfortunately, our critical infrastructure is under threat. All infrastructure in this picture is um, worth paying attention to because it is connected to internet systems. And while these connections to the internet um, and you know, while this critical infrastructure is modern and updated and allows um, it to be more effective and useful in our lives, there definitely are threats and vulnerabilities. You know, we can go back to the Colonial Pipeline um, example, um, Microsoft, Google, Equifax, you know, it goes on and on in the US. Um, globally, the African Union um, was hacked, um, the Central Bank of Bangladesh. And so there's so many examples out there that show us that, you know, this is real. Unfortunately, from a small business perspective, we don't tend to hear as many stories from people about what they're experiencing within this space and what's going on. And so I definitely think this is a great platform to have that conversation, to increase our awareness, um, and also to improve our own security. Another aspect that I'm seeing, especially in the work I do um, in emerging markets, is really that even though the number of people getting online is huge, there is still a digital divide with respect to large scale infrastructure. That is changing and that's changing in part to what I mentioned earlier with the Chinese construction of critical infrastructure in these countries. What's not clear in a lot of countries is what protection mechanisms the Chinese are putting in and how countries that are receiving this infrastructure can protect themselves. 
So right now, it's the case that a lot of countries in emerging markets have older infrastructure that is harder to penetrate just because it isn't connect to, connected to the internet. But once those connections happen, the question is, will they be able to control their infrastructure or will their infrastructure be controlled elsewhere? The last aspect on this that I think is really relevant is a majority of the world, um, upwards of you know, 95% of internet traffic, accesses their internet through undersea cables. There's definitely a security concern there that is talked about within the space, but is not more widely um, discussed. Um, now, there is an opportunity there. Uh, there is also a coordination responsibility between countries that are accessing internet through undersea cables, but also going back to my previous point, um, an opportunity there for global collaboration of countries who do access joint cables going under different seabeds uh, to work with one another to protect their internet infrastructure. The fourth aspect of trends that I think is important to highlight is one around evolving legal frameworks. Um, unfortunately, even myself being a lawyer, one of the things that um, I do recognize is that the law has always been a slow moving tool for reform. Um, but big tech and you know the insecurity that has resulted is starting to challenge lawmakers and starting to move them a bit quicker than they probably normally would have been. Lawmakers around the world, unfortunately, really can't keep up with the innovations that are coming out of the internet and the security threats attached to that. Within the US context, something that has been quite topical and we hear about every so often is really the inability of Congress to regulate Facebook and other big tech companies. Um, and in Facebook's case, you know, one of the ongoing complaints is its failure to protect user privacy. Um, and it struggles you know, with the misinformation and disinformation on its platforms and really the impact of Facebook on people's mental health. Um, now, while in the US, Congress has gone back and forth and continues to threaten to regulate Facebook and other entities, but hasn't yet done so, what we're seeing from across the world in China is the government taking a very strong stance towards regulation. Now, that strong stance towards regulation started with companies like Alibaba and sanctioning its CEO, and now has moved all the way into the realm of when young people access the internet to play um, video games and play online. Part of this is the recognition of some of the threats to individuals. And part of it is just a broader government clamp down um, on the internet sector and a demonstration of how hard or rather how easy it is for a state like China to really manage the internet. And managing the internet is an ongoing discussion within the space of whose role is it, uh, whether it's government, whether it's the private sector to self-manage. But I think that that ongoing debate and the difference in how uh, governments deal with regulation is one that um, I particularly find interesting to watch and follow. From my time um, working, whether it was in Zambia um, or in Uganda, I think one of the challenges that I saw there was really um, low capacity within regulators to keep up with some of these trends. And after keeping up with these trends, really deciding what the best way forward is with those markets um, and how to regulate in a way that really does protect consumer protection and really allows still for innovation. I think another aspect that I experienced is just how complicated these legal frameworks are. It's not simply having a cybersecurity law. Um, there are many other interlinked laws that are relevant and important within the space. And unless you do have that cross section of laws, it becomes really hard to legislate one and not the other and make sure that um, not only are they relevant, but them as uh, lawmakers will really be able to enforce the legal frameworks that they put in place. 
the last part that I'll mention really around um, kind of what I'm seeing within evolving legal frameworks is really the use of inter the internet, not only as um, a tool for free markets and commerce, um, but also that being opposed to the use of the internet um, as an authoritarian space. Um, now, when I, from a legal perspective and looking at legal frameworks, um, a lot of countries um, within emerging markets have really started using cyber laws as a way to restrict uh, political activism and dissent. Um, and that is definitely a concerning point. Um, in 2018, for instance, there were 21 partial or internet shutdowns, um, which was an increase from 2017 on the continent of Africa. And what that shows is that governments are not looking simply at um, the internet as a tool for all and um, a tool for best use of its populations, but rather as a tool that can be controlled. So in the same vein, um, if a tool can be controlled by government, it begs the question, you know, with, a, with respect to security, how much governments are really involved in um, making sure that they protect, but also track and watch some of the um, some of the platforms, apps and businesses that are operating across borders. The last trend that I think is really interesting and you know worth noting is really considering the wicked and big nature um, of cybersecurity threats around the world, we have a huge challenge related to cyber skills. We don't have enough people to tackle this challenge. So it begs the question, um, you know, are we defeated before we even start? Um, I use the example here of the United Kingdom really as a demonstration that, you know, what we hear in the US is not unique. The United Kingdom, other countries around the world do continue to experience um, critical skills challenges within the space. Um, but even though their, you know, their needs are, you know, really, really immense. One of the areas of opportunity, I think, is really focused efforts on starting education at an early age and really sensitizing young people who are already on the internet and who are already coding and engaged to really be aware of you know, cyber threats and risks. Another aspect is really focused around um, inclusion. Um, the stats around inclusion in the cybersecurity sector are not great. And I think that this is an opportunity, especially within the US context, to bring in more people that typically haven't been involved. That is a combination of women, that is a combination of people of color, and really understand that different people come to solving this problem with different lenses. And all of those different lenses ultimately help and contribute to us having a safer, um, and more secure environment online. Yeah. I'll stop there with the trends and really um, walk you through some of the global solutions before going to some of the localized solutions of things that we as small business owners and individuals can do. From a global perspective, I think it's collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. I can't say that and emphasize that enough. Um, there definitely needs to be increased and improved mechanisms for reporting and sharing information. Um, information across borders and law enforcement officials need to cooperate more um, to stop crimes, especially cross-border crimes. There is an opportunity for business associations, not only you know, within different uh, individual locations, but to work across the world with other business associations to think through um, how they can defend and protect the sector at large. From a government perspective, um, there is a component there of um, global cooperation and support. Um, recently, you know, there was support from the US Africa Command to African counterparts. And those conversations need to be ongoing 
between the US and other parts of the world because intelligence comes from everywhere, but equally support to keep us all safe um, equally comes from information garnered from partners in different parts of the world. There is also a huge opportunity for the government to work with the private sector. Um, the private sector has definitely had strong um, protect as, uh, protections and responses in and of itself, but it is important to collaborate with government to find some um, solutions. The second point is really around education. I mentioned that before, just from a sector perspective, but I think it's also important that as we continue to decrease the digital divide um, in the U.S., as the government puts more money into internet infrastructure around the U.S. and gets to 5G um, across the country, that goes along with um, digital literacy. It shouldn't be simply a matter of putting up the infrastructure. Uh, part of putting up the infrastructure is making sure that we also do have the soft skills and ability and understanding and knowledge to keep ourselves safe. The easiest part would be putting that within the educational curriculum, but equally business associations and uh, business centers like yours, I think play a critical, critical uh, role. The last is really around, um, you know, standardization. As we upgrade our critical infrastructure, we need to make sure that as a country, all of that infrastructure is well protected. Um, and we are, um, as a country, able to invest in the necessary um, protections as well. So, the last part of my presentation is really a question to you know, everyone in the audience. What should we do? What is the role of you as a small business, you as an individual, and what can you do? The first is um, employ best practices. Um, we need to train ourselves um, and our staff. Uh, we need to make sure they understand, for instance, at the most basic level, you know, how to spot a phishing email um, and how to use good browsing practices, uh, what not to download, um, how not to share um, or how to protect customer and vendor information. The other is, you know, using and updating our virus software. Um, you know, we do get notices on our screens and so making sure that that is up to date is critical. We need to make sure that we're on secure networks. It's easy now uh, when we're working remotely to go to a cafe and to go to public places, but um, we definitely should make sure we understand the implications of that on our own and business security and making sure that our staff are aware of that as well. I can't emphasize enough uh, using strong passwords and changing them often. Um, you know, it seems pretty simplistic and self-explanatory, uh, but once again, something that is critical for us to do. Backing up our data is very important. And as we move information to the cloud, equally making sure that we use the right um, and appropriate um, etiquette to make sure that our cloud uh, space is also not vulnerable. Um, for businesses that deal with um, cash, which is pretty much most, um, really making sure that our payment processing systems are secure. Um, for someone who works across borders where, you know, some people, you know, don't understand the gravity, people have sent me information that they haven't. And that's a conversation that I've also had to have with people I engage to protect their information um, rather than, you know, mine as well. Um, mobile networks, I think, is one that I mentioned earlier. More people are getting on the phone, more people are accessing information through their mobiles. It's really making sure that we keep our mobiles secure as well. All of these obviously do sound very basic, but I think it is making sure that we continue to have these reminders. We continue to engage our teams on this, that that 95% um, uh, hacks that I mentioned earlier and vulnerabilities and where that comes from reduces exponentially over time. Um, the next point, which I think is really important, is really to understand and assess our risk. Um, the Small Business Administration um, is one amazing tool, and they have lots online that can really help us do that. But besides that, I think, you know, it's going to the Federal Communications um, Commission, it's Department of Homeland Security, 
Um, all of these tools can really help us understand and do provide us cheap, free um, access to support to help us as small businesses to succeed. One thing I can't emphasize enough is really the need to get cyber liability insurance. Um, over time, this has become um, not optional as it was several years ago. It is a must for someone who is running a small business because the amount that you might lose over time is really just not worth it. One thing that I think I've worked with clients on um, and also in my own role as a board director of companies has really been elevating the importance of cyber risk to being a matter for board risk and having boards of directors really understand what role they play in working with teams on strategy around managing cyber risk. Um, but also understanding what to do as far as business continuity if they are affected by any cyber threats. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of engaging at the highest level of your uh, governance structures, um, understanding what cyber risk really means to your business continuity. The last is really around tracking what is going on in the news, what is going on in Congress, and really being part of the, the legislative process. Engage your Congress people to really highlight the fact that this is an issue that affects you and you do need them to regulate this and why it matters for you as a business operating within their constituency. Um, and having engaged my own um, legislators, these are issues that they are interested to hear more about. They are interested to know what small businesses are experiencing and how they can really support you in your own um, growth um, and your own growth within their um, constituencies. On that note, I really would like to thank you all for um, having participated today and going back to the beginning of my presentation. It's a small world. All of us are affected by cybersecurity. And as small business owners, we do have a role to play in not only keeping ourselves safe, but really of educating um, those around us on the vulnerabilities and making sure that they, as employees, and other stakeholders are equally safe. Thank you again.